So thanks very much. Uh, I'm going to be very self-conscious because I can see myself in the mirror. <laughs> but I wanted to begin by saying I'm very sorry that Nancy Powell can't be with us today. Uh, it was near the beginning of the summer that Nancy reached out to me, asked me to come here, and um, we, we began um, an email correspondence partly about the reading um, but we were also trading stories about some of our health problems. And uh, Nancy was very encouraging, you know, as she was. She was very upbeat in the emails. Uh, she loved to put three exclamation points after every <laughs> sentence. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> and I, I remember. Uh, in one of my last emails to her, I ended with an exclamation point. I said, let's stay healthy, exclamation point. I also said in uh, the email that uh, I hope to see the light at the end of that proverbial tunnel. And I said, uh, I hope the light isn't a train heading my <laughs> way. <laughs> And so I, I thought I would uh, read you um, a couple of lines typical of her humor in her last email. She said, hey, if you see the light and it's a train, hop onto one of the cars and tell them you're on a journey. <laughs> exclamation, exclamation. <laughs> Eventually that wow. train stops and you're where you want to be two exclamation points, <coughs> in the town of healthy, capital H, exclamation, exclamation, exclamation. So I think uh, all of us uh, sincerely hope that she would make it to the town of healthy. So I thought I'd uh, begin my reading by reading some poems that uh, reminded me of her because I had known her, like many of you, for many years. Uh, uh, the, uh, the first uh, poem is called uh, Mountain View Cemetery. And I was thinking of this poem partly because I went to my father's burial ceremony at Mountain View Cemetery on the bottom of a mountain in western Maine, Tumbledown Mountain, where my family has had a cottage on a, on a lake for about the last uh, century. And after the ceremony, I climbed the mountain. And um, as you'll see, it begins with a monarch butterfly. Uh, of course, when I think of monarch butterflies, I think of these two characters <laughs> over here who, who grow monarch butterflies. And I assume that you released one. Uh, we did. Yeah, yeah. We as, did. As you often For Nancy. do. <clears throat> uh, I mentioned that lingonberries. Uh, uh, my family has climbed this mountain for decades and decades, and often we uh, pick lingonberries a lot of wild. Lingonberries are like wild cranberries. Oh, yeah. So it's about this journey up and the journey down to the cemetery, <clears throat> Mountain View Cemetery. To get back to that high clarity, like the monarch butterfly shifting in wind and veering up cliffs to the sun-struck summit rock, its wings ragged, its tiger markings chafed by the buffeting. To gaze once more like a Babylonian astronomer at stars lit by the first lightning blast. To get back to that original fire cooling into radiant dust from which we can only swerve, dip, and fly to a place beyond the remotest idea of place, to a time beyond every notion of time, waving to it as if to a friend who has vanished beyond the highest peak. To get closer, I climbed a trail over washed out roots and culverts into shadows scrawled by birch trees shaken by wind. I crawled over a cornice its lichen slicked down by a waterfall's mist before jumping over rocks in a pond spillway 
and kneeling in crevices behind boulders to gather the small, red, bittersweet stars of lingonberries in an old milk can. In the last light that was clear as waves tapping the granite shore, I hiked down to the cemetery of small town loggers, farmers, and soldiers who died in every war from the revolution to Vietnam. In our family burial plot, I left the can of lingonberries among leaves scattered from half-dead maples and knew the trees, buried by future centuries of rain and snow, would harden into black rock printed with fossils. And the sun would fall equally over the high peaks and graves, scribbling its signature in whatever flourished from dirt, giving back to the living whatever its light had turned green, whatever had been saved and could speak in fiery tongues of that splendor on the mountain. So, <clears throat> rather a lofty poem in some ways going up to some sublime place, uh, but also down to earth. Uh, the journey is up, but also down. And one thing I admired about Nancy, perhaps you had this experience too, was that uh, she was both lofty and very down to earth. For example, uh, we enjoyed talking about <coughs> chainsawing and splitting firewood. Uh, we, we had this conversation uh, a number of, of times. Uh, I, was probably, I grew up on this farm. Uh, my parents converted over to wood-burning stoves for heat back in the, the 70s. So I did, and I still do, a lot of chainsawing work and uh, uh, firewood splitting. And I, I must admit, I don't have many friends who like to talk about chainsawing and, <laughs> and, and, and chainsawing. So a few weeks ago, uh, one of my friends came over. My wife and I were sitting in our living room by a glass table and just <clears throat> chatting about this and that. And then my friend stood up and he said, uh, so, so Henry, uh, I see you, you keep your pornography on the glass table here. <laughs> I, I had no idea what he was talking about. And he went over and he, he picked up a catalog that I had just gotten from Ace Hardware, all about steel chainsaws. Steel is one of the best companies that makes chainsaws. All these picture descriptions. So as I say, a, a, a lot of my friends think of chainsaws as obscene. <laughs> but, but, not, but not Nancy. We had long conversations about uh, chainsaw. So I thought uh, in her honor I would read one of my chainsaw poems. And so after, after a hurricane, this was some time ago, a huge tree fell in a ravine close to where I live, and at one point I was asked to go down into the ravine. I mean, the tree was gigantic, um, very old, cut up the tree, split it up. Um, I gave away most of the, the wood. I, I like to make piles of wood. I put a, a sign up, free firewood, and the wood is gone. Oh. <laughs> So this poem is called After the Hurricane. <clears throat> and uh, in this particular hurricane, we lost power for, I think it was eight days. <laughs> My wife was not happy. <laughs> <clears throat> After the Hurricane. Without power, we lit candles, cooked potatoes and hot dogs in the fireplace, tried to sleep with air clinging to our skin like damp <laughs> feathers. Of course, the AC wasn't working. Near dawn on the third dark night, the old oak on the Civil War redoubt across the street crashed into the ravine, shaking our house. I shuffled out the door in flip-flops, pointed my cell phone light at cracks in the foundation, beer cans clattering down gutters. 
The oak wallowed like a beached whale in the runoff. The colonel next door held up an axe and shouted, let the damn thing harden to coal. <laughs> By the time a town official taped a cleanup order on our door, ants had colonized its hollows. Woodpeckers drilled its bark for grubs. Chainsawing the trunk from rotted crown to roots still clotted with clay, I felt the heartwood toughen, the red chips sting my face. On the first night of January, I carried wood seasoned all fall in the garage to the fireplace, lit balled up newspaper, and waited. <laughs> like salamanders in legends I once believed, the split logs never burned. They just hissed and darkened, <laughs> refusing to give up whatever had kept them whole in the damp ravine. Even when I pumped the bellows, only the news broke into flames beneath them. So I was thinking of breaking news, but the newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> Every day we have breaking news. And I don't know if you know of that old legend about salamanders, yeah. supposedly salamanders uh, if they were in the fire, um, wouldn't get burned, and then they would just come out. Apparently, I think back during the Middle Ages, uh, sometimes logs would be put into a fire and there would be salamanders in the logs, and then they would run out. So they developed this reputation of being immune to fire. Uh. <clears throat> Oh, yeah, well, speaking of salamanders, I thought I'd read another down-to-earth poem in memory of, of Nancy. Um, this is uh, called The Red Eft. Um, now, when I was growing up, um, I did a lot of gardening. In college, I did a lot of gardening for a number of uh, elderly women in New Hampshire um, in the late 80s, and I would often come across these little salamanders. I called them newts. Yeah. And my, my mother, who is uh, a naturalist, uh, said, would always correct me, no, no, no. Uh, technically, those are called red Fs. And Bob, remember your friend, don't well, they? Very well, then, yeah. yes. The red yes. F, is it red press? Red editions. Yes, yeah. Is it, is yeah. It, mm -hmm. But I'm sure you've seen them, um, these little very cute orange lizards, and they have like scarlet stars on their back. So anyways, uh, I was writing this poem when uh, I was reading Beowulf and uh, quite a few Anglo-Saxon poems. Those poems are written in alliterative verse. You know, you can hear the syllables chiming. And, and, I, and I thought of this little lizard as a kind of dragon, like the dragon or dragons in uh, Beowulf. Uh, maybe a, a little tiny dragon guarding, <laughs> guarding a garden, guarding a, a treasure. And you know, the dragons get killed in Beowulf, I'm afraid this little dragon gets killed, but the poem has a happy end. Uh, the, the red elf gets resurrected uh, by rose bushes, and the red elf turns into a red rose and uh, a voice that, that lingers. I was thinking of the poem partly because uh, I, I can hear Nancy's voice when people pass on, but their voices uh, remain. So this, yeah, this was in my my first book, uh, The Ghost Ship. I'm sure you can hear all the alliteration. The red eft is the diminished dinosaur, dragon of the dark ages, guardian of gardens. Under flocks, kind of flower, by green gates, he bars out blackbirds, bullheaded bees, inquisitive cats. He sits for hours like a root, a coil of hell flame frozen on ground mold. He listens as wind shakes shadows from flowers to sounds unheard by men. Caterpillars sawing plantain, patter of flies on sorrel, heartbeat of toads, squelch of night crawlers beaten out by the digging. From time to time he creeps from his familiar damp, 
his peach sliver feet feeling away over folds of cultivated loam through weed piles and braids of dead daffodil shoots, past tiger lilies over trenches and spikes of sunburnt lawn. Nimbly he steps over twigs, his back flecked with a map of scarlet stars, his whole body the candle flame that lights his path. Mowing carelessly, I gutted one. Oh! <laughs> it has a happy end. <laughs> His cherub flesh left no blood on grass. Gentle gestures, suave steps, left no trace. Quietly, I raked his shreds over rose roots where water could write them up stalks on rainy days so gray-haired women could snip them, grandchildren pluck them, those blood-red ghosts, those mouths pried open. <coughs> so I was thinking of the, the rose as kind of a, a red mouth and leaving a, a voice uh, behind. <laughs>